Hello mate and welcome back to the second part of our Using Realistic Humans in Unity tutorial. So if you follow on with the previous video, you should have everything you need to get started. So let's jump right into it. Our first step, of course, is to create a Unity project, which we're going to do using the Unity Hub here. As you can see, I'm using version 22.1.13 F1. And we have to make sure that we select 3D HDRP core as our type of project and then set up your project name and location and then hit create project. Now that our project is created, it will open up. And as you can see in our project, we have our main camera, our sun and our sky and fog volumes in there. And then we have um, our assets down here in the project. What we want to do at this point is create a new folder, which we're going to do by right clicking and create new folder. And then we can just put real using characters folder in there so that we can import all of our characters into folders in here in subfolders that we can create um, but before we do anything else what we now need to do is visit the real Illusion website and download the unity auto setup tool once you've got that selected and downloaded which you can do by following the link in the description we need to install the package and we have to do it manually so what we need to do is in window and package manager. You can see that I already have a number of elements here installed. What we're going to do is click on the plus icon here in the top left hand corner and we're going to go install package from disk. We're going to browse to the folder where we've saved our download, select that and then let it install. Once you've installed, what you will need to do is restart Unity so that your menu option is actually available. Now that we've restarted Unity, you can see that we now have an option at the top in our menu called Reillusion, which has a number of options within it. We're not actually going to use any of those right now. The first thing we need to do is inside our Reillusion characters folder, we're going to create another new subfolder. And we're just going to name this one whatever we want to call our character. It doesn't even have to be the name of the actual character, just some way for you to identify who it is. So I'm just going to put RL underscore zero one. And then into that folder, we're going to drag the contents of our exported character, including the FBM file and all of the folders from the previous tutorial. So we should drag all the files into that folder here. So what we've copied across is our FBM folder, our textures folder, the actual FBX file itself, and then the JavaScript file accompanied it. And that has given us the entirety of the contents that we need to continue with our next part. Now that we've got those files into our Unity project, now we can go to Reillusion and Import Characters. And it will actually open up a little sub window here. And as you can see, the character that we've just imported will appear in the top left hand corner on the left hand side here. So we can just select that character and then go through the menu options here. And now obviously we're going to want the highest quality materials that we can possibly use. So, you know, there might be a good use case for the basic materials. If perhaps you were using this character as a crowd, basically we just will leave that into high quality. Next is parallax eyes, basic size or refractive SSR eyes. Again, I'm just going to go for the, the best possible options here. I do have quite a powerful um, computer. So if you are struggling with performance issues, then maybe leave some of these things in the more basic settings. But for the most part, Unity is a pretty well optimized piece of software. So you shouldn't need to turn too many things down. I'm going to obviously keep my wrinkle maps and my two pass hair there. Now we can say bake custom shaders or leave them as default shaders. I'm going to leave that as bake custom shaders. And then I'm also going to say bake separate prefab because I want to keep this original file in case I do manage to do something that completely messes things up later on in the project. So if we create a prefab from it, then we can just play with settings without affecting our original content that we've imported. So now what we're going to do is we're going to hit our build materials button and the auto setup tool will go through and do everything that we need it to do to be able to use this character at its most basic form within Unity. 
And as you can see now we've created our prefab. I can actually just drag my prefab into the scene straight away, make sure that she's above ground level and I can actually move my camera around and have a look at what we've got. And it is basically exactly as we expected our character that we created in Character Creator and that we've added animations to in Unity now looks exactly like she does in, uh, in Unity, so that's good. So what we need to do now is click on a couple of these other options. First thing I'm gonna do is I'm going to process and extract and rename the character animations and create a default character animator controller. Now we can do that using our character that we've imported. If you open up the character that we've imported here, you can see all of the associated information and we've got a, a T pose there. But what we've got here is this is the animation file for our character. This is all of the animations that we added in iClone mashed together in one. And you can actually hit play and you can see down in the bottom corner here, if I expand that a little bit, you can see her going through the animations that we have applied to her. So before I start messing around with animations, what I'm actually going to do is I'm going to click on this physics-y kind of icon up here that looks like an atom. I'm going to rebuild the character's physics so that the hair and the clothing and other things actually behave in a way that we want them to. It shouldn't take too long. That should be a fairly quick process, that one. And now I can actually click on the character itself. And then up here in the top, you can see that there's an animation section. And if I bring this uh, menu back down so that it's a little bit smaller, we can actually see a whole bunch of stuff going on here. This is actually a really basic setup to do, but we have to make sure we do it correctly. Firstly, we need to actually select our animation file, not the T-Pose file. And then you can see that it's 1800 frames long. And if I hit play, it will go through those 1800 frames, playing the animations one after the other. And what we have to do is ascertain when one animation ends and another one begins so that we can actually separate them out. So to me, it looks like our first animation where she walks and comes to a standstill ends about there, like so. So we can actually create a new animation file and we'll call this one walk to stop or something along those lines. And then all we have to do in this detail is actually say when the animation begins and when it ends. So we can actually bring our end marker down using our tool there. And we can actually see in the little histogram type of graph that shows up when the motion ends. So I think that that pretty much covers that animation there. It's about 165 frames long. And if we just hit play now, it will actually play the loop that we've cut out. So we're going to repeat that process for another animation. This one's going to be stand idle. You don't have to use underscores. I just do as a computer programmer thing. Now we know that that animation does, doesn't start until a frame 165 when she starts, when she stops moving. So we can actually now go through our animation using our histogram marker and we can see that there's a blatant jump there at the end of that so I would say that that is the end of that animation file and then again we're going to do the next thing so we know that this one stand idle 2 starts at frame 880 and then it ends at the very end so far as I can tell we can actually just play the animation and see if there are any weird jumps in her motion and if there are we can cut it out. As far as I remember, I only added three animations to this particular character. I think this last one is quite a, a long animation. And it is, there we go. So those are our three animations that are now separated out. So that's cool. And we hit apply there, and it's going to split up all of those and create some new animation files here, which we see stand idle, stand idle to, and walk to stop. So that gives us those animations that we can now use in the animator to make our character basically run through a sequence of animations if we want her to. Of course, our next stage is to actually apply these animations to our character. And what has actually been done automatically for us is that this animator control has been applied to our character. 
But if you want to make absolutely sure that that's happened, you can simply just drag it over onto your character and then select that. And then if you actually double click on that animated controller, what you can see is the animator. I'm going to drag the animator down here so that we can actually see what's going on up here for a moment. So when our character enters the scene, it plays the entirety of the animation that has been added. And what you can see is that the Stand Idle 2 animation has already been dropped into here. So if I were to actually make a transition from there to there, or rather from there to there, and remove this one, our character now will go straight into the Stand Idle pose when we hit play. Now the camera I currently don't have set up, so when I hit play, what we will actually see is from a great distance our character is playing through that animation, but we want to be able to see this a little bit more close up, or do we? So what we're going to do is we're going to create a new camera in our scene, and then we can hit Control Shift and F, and that camera should then jump to our viewport position. So now when we hit play, what we should see is the character from a slightly closer, there we go, playing through that animation, doing what we want her to do. Now that we've covered how to get our characters into the scene and split up the animations and get those animations to play, it's time to talk very quickly about adding cameras. Now the default camera is great if you want to control it manually, but if we're creating cutscenes, what we can do is we can use another package called Cinemachine. So if we go back to our window and our package manager, within the Unity registry, if we do a search for Cinemachine, what you'll see is that there is indeed a package called Cinemachine which we can now install. And then that will allow us to add virtual cameras and animate them to be able to output our cutscenes. Once we've installed that package, what we need to be able to do is we need to be able to see our timeline. So in window and under sequencing, we'll see timeline. So we'll bring that up and then we will bring that down into the bottom panel just so that we can see that there. So what we need to do now is create a game object, an empty game object, and we're just going to call this one timeline. And then with that selected, you can now see that we have the ability to create a timeline and we're just going to save that timeline for the sake of the, this animation. And now you can see that we what we have here is a sequence. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to create a couple of cameras so that we can play with them in Cinemachine. So the next stage is to actually use the current existing camera in our frame. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to position this camera where I want to, and then I'm going to making sure that I've got the camera selected control shift and F and that will line up our camera as is. What I'm then going to do is right click in my hierarchy and I'm going to create a new virtual camera and we're just going to leave that as CM VCam one. And if I actually back away, what you can see is that our virtual camera has actually appeared in the same position as our current camera and that position will just remain there. And I'm going to create another virtual camera under Cinemachine, the virtual camera. And then if you notice, if I back away, that virtual camera has actually appeared where my camera is at that moment. So what I currently have is two cameras like so. Now I'm also going to have kind of a panning shot, which requires two more cameras. So I'm going to bring this down to here, create another virtual camera, and then a second camera round to about here. And perhaps I'll go up a little bit just for the sake of a bit of fun and then create another camera like that using the same virtual camera thing. So what I have now is three virtual cameras. So I'm going to select my timeline again and I'm actually going to drag my CM VCam one into my uh, clip here and I'm going to add a control track like so. I'm now going to add a second camera which is our second shot I'm going to bring that in like so and next one I'm going to bring in my vcam 3 again same thing again and then my cm vm cam 4 like so and what I'm actually going to do is leave those like that now if I were to drag that like that I can see all of my cameras like so and if I were to hit play you can see that we start off in the camera in that position 
Then we jump to the next position. And then we jump to that camera. And then for the briefest of moments, we jump back to that camera. So that's actually our way of controlling how our cameras are going to work during the game. And if I were to hit this button here, and actually run the, the game, what you can see is that the camera that the game uses changes to the camera that we have selected in the CM machine like so. Like that. Now what you'll notice is that the last camera actually jumped rather than blending and that's because we didn't have the tracks perfectly together and we can actually achieve the same effect if we want to by deliberately adding space between our cameras. So let's do that. And we don't want the camera to snap there, but I do want my cameras to kind of merge in that second bit of the shot. So now if I were to hit the play button, we can see what's happening. Give it a chance again to compile. So we start off looking at her, looking particularly disinterested in poor old Barry there, who's having a bit of a dance next to her, desperately trying to get her attention. And then we snap to our fire away shot. And then you can see our camera kind of zooms up above there to see him really going for it and trying hard. And then we come back to our original camera position just in time to see the animation end. So that's a really basic overview of how to create the cinematics in our game. There is a lot more advanced stuff that you can do with Cinemachine and I would certainly recommend that you spend a little bit of time looking up tutorials on Cinemachine on YouTube or elsewhere if you want to, to enable you to achieve much more advanced things. But that's the absolute basics on how to get your cameras to move so that you can create cinematics using your real humans from iClone and Character Creator 4. So I hope you enjoyed that tutorial. I'm keen to hear your feedback. And of course, I look forward to seeing what awesome things you managed to create using Unity with iClone 8 and the auto import tool. So until then, you stay awesome, guys. Bye bye.